Well, hello, our fellow friends, our fellow neighbors, and our fellow shining stars. Our next trolley stop is here, and our next trolley stop is now. Welcome back to another all-new episode of PR from the Hearts Children's Book Spotlight Series. To be precise, we have reached episode number 178. That is the 178th trolley stop here at PR from the Heart and the Children's Book Spotlight Series as part of our summer reading season, which we're, of course, continuing to share here throughout the course of these coming weeks and months ahead, because, of course, we always love the summer reading season here at PR from the Heart. I am John Massalonis, the manager of PR from the Heart and the host of the Children's Book Spotlight Series, along with little squirmy Nick Squirm himself, little Forrest. Of course, he's a big proponent of summer reading as well, too. We're really looking forward to this particular trolley stop because... Mm -hmm we're really gonna be focusing on the importance of creativity today. And oftentimes creativity can be overlooked. In many respects, creativity can be shunned. And it's really important for us as parents and caregivers to do our part to be able to nurture the creativity of our little ones, to let them know that it is normal and natural to have all of their creative energies be expressed in the wonderful ways that they share their creativity and to do our part to help them strengthen that in the process and yes to have a healthy relationship with our brain and our nervous system now i know i know you might be saying john the nervous system the brain science it can sound you know stuff with the body can sound a little boring but leave it to a brand new children's book that is helping us to be able to see the way to let all of us know the child within us and children all around the world to let them know that their brains our brains are beautiful, they're magnificent in so many ways, shapes, and forms, and they are our friends, not our enemies. We encourage all of you, listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and of course, our fellow Shining Stars, to head on over to the official website of our featured guest here on episode number 178 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. We've included the link to Janine Letford's official website in the description below. Of course, you can also head on over to Amazon.com if that is your preferred online vehicle of your choosing. You can leave a five-star review. That is one of the many ways that you can pledge your support, again, for our featured guest that is joining us here on episode number 178 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. The trolley doesn't have to travel very far. We head on out from San Diego, California, over to the Phoenix, Arizona area, to be precise, Buckeye, Arizona. Joining us is national award-winning educator and best-selling children's author, Janine Ledford, joining us here on the program this week. Janine, thank you for spending some of your time with us here around the 4th of July holiday. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for all your work of getting all of these messages of all of these authors out to the world. Right. Received on my end of things. Before, of course, we continue with this episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series, if you are new to the program, or if you are a longtime listener, viewer, and supporter, one of the many ways that you can pledge your support for Janine along with us here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series, if these messages that we're already sharing and communicating and we'll be diving into further and momentarily, we encourage you, if you haven't had the opportunities to do so, to subscribe to PR from the Heart's official YouTube channel and to share this very special trolley stuff that you are now enjoying. That is episode number 178 of the Children's Book Spotlight Series as we are on the road to 5,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. So for everyone who has supported us over nearly the past five years, a big thank you in the process. There's so much to get into because this isn't the traditional children's book. You're not the traditional children's author. This really is a family affair. Now, I know that, that can seem like a very cliche, markety PR expression, but we're going to be talking about all that, your family's involvement in, in your work. I'm, I'm fascinated to to learn more about your origin story and to be able to have you share that with our listeners and viewers because at some point in time for all of us when we're called to do work for children sometimes it can be a specific experience that we have this aha moment that says i was put here on this earth to do right by kids and to do blah 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 for them whatever it necessarily is or it can be a series of experiences or it's these random you know divine synchrony synchronicities that land up just uh, revealing themselves and it's like oh this is what I meant to do for those of our listeners and viewers who are learning about you for the first point in time they're learning about my brain my brain my beautiful brain and learning about your work as a children's author as well as being America's creative coach as well too where and when did this really begin for you where you knew that a large 
part of your purpose here on this planet was to be for children? Well, I think I wrote about this in my personal essay applying to college. And I remember my mother having a speckled walnut and there was um, her godchild there. She was about three or four and she opened the walnut. My mom opened the walnut and the child was very mesmerized and in awe. And then my mother ate what was inside and the child's face was like, oh my goodness. And that always stayed with me just to be present in the, in the opportunity of watching a, a child or a human being have that aha moment. And that's when I really knew that I wanted to enter into the field of education. I am an educator by trade. I taught for 15 years in the Canoga Park area, which is north of Los Angeles. I taught third grade for a number of years and then ran the music and arts and creative um, development pro programs at the same school. I've only worked at one school my entire career. And then in 2019, I felt the, the push that there is this huge conversation about the lack of creativity in you know the school system as well as the workforce and then i saw you know data and research i'm i'm heavily researched uh, being a U U ucla bruin you know a lot of my my work is based on on that and i saw that the world economic forum said that the top three skills needed in the workforce one of those was creativity and the other two were related to creative think thinking and, and now they, they just put out another list creativity is now number two Hmm. And so because of my unique pos position, I taught elementary school. Um, I started a nonprofit for the graduates of my elementary school, sixth through, through 12th graders called Alumni 360. I was working at California State University Northridge, um, helping teachers who were getting their master's degree in uh, creative arts and arts in integration. And then I also served on the board of DonorsChoose.org. I'm not sure if your listeners are familiar with that organization. Ed educators are, or at least should be. They help teachers get supplies and, and books, all these great books that you're talking about into their classroom. And so I served on the board of directors and, you know, to the right of me was the CEO of LinkedIn to the, to the left, to the left of me was the senior vice presidents of Facebook and uh, just Teresa Gao and Stephen Colbert and Yvette Nicole Brown, some pretty, pretty significant names. And there I am like the kindergarten te a teacher. So it was a very interesting position to be because in one week I was working with a four-year-old all the way to a 64-year-old, different cultures, social economic backgrounds, educational levels in one week. And so I just saw the whole pipeline and I said, this could be an issue of how are we educating our kids? Are we supporting their creative thinking? Cause that's what the workforce is looking for. Not just someone getting straight A's and perfect scores on the SAT. And they're able just to think logically and in, and in steps. They're looking for that human being that can think in non-linear ways that are, that's great at metaphorical thinking that can be kind of in different areas and then synthesize all that information together and that has yes i do have a brain on my on my desk since that's <laughs> a big part of my work now that has integrated brains but what does it look like to have an integrated brain uh for this for our lives and for our workforce so that really is my origin story and the impetus of the work that you see today one of the things and thank you for sharing all of that one of the things that i really admire about you and your work is the fact that um when someone has been within the realm of academia, whether they are a doctor or a psychiatrist or they're a you know superintendent of a school, it's very easy to be in the analytical. It's very easy to be in the uh, speaking the language that a fifth grader wouldn't necessarily understand. But at the same point in time, it takes a very special soul to be able to share one's message for one's heart. Not saying that all of these people that are in their heads and doing the scientific kind of approach and sharing things from the analytical perspective that they're not in their heart, but you blend this well with wearing your heart on your sleeve, connecting your message with your heart. So you're really able to reach everyone, no matter where they're on their, their path. And that's a very special skill set. How important is it for you to be able to focus on the thinking component, but to also blend that with being in your heart so that you're really, not even just presenting this from a well-balanced perspective, but to just really connect with not only the minds, but also the hearts of children, parents, and families, and really anyone who is a caregiver or a custodian for a child. Sure, that's a great question because, you know, 
being at UCLA, you're getting my undergrad graduate from 97 to about 2002. That was really the onset of some of the fMRI technology that is really fueling this, this revolution of, of the brain. I'm telling people we're in the decade of the brain because when you and I were growing up, you know, I don't know how old you are, but you know, I'm a, an 80s ba baby. And so, you know, they just, they just knew what they've known for decades prior since the ninth, early 1900s. And that's how they knew to talk or, or, or to teach. But now with the onset of FR, fMRI technology and some other technology where we can actually see what's going on in the brain and, and how your brain is actually affecting my brain right, right now as you're communicating with me and sharing your lived experience, we now can move that into how we teach and how we parent and how we lead. And we're learning that, number one, your brain is wired more for social interaction. And your brain is more emotional than than anything. And so with this in information, even though, you know, people like you and I, we, you know, that's the name of your, comp your company, PR from, from the heart, right? <laughs> so you know the importance of connecting with people's emotional language, right? And their emotional hooks. And if you look at advertising, they don't just give you the list of the specs. They give you what, what could your life look like if you got this product? There's, there's scientific neurological reasons why all this is being laid out that way. And emotion moves pe people. So if advertisers, advertisements can use it for advertisements, why shouldn't we bring it in to education and to parents and, or, or for parenting? Why can't I know more about the emotional language and the emotional tools? And so when I, I teach and I tell people, you know, I, I did leave the classroom, but uh, my heart is in K-12. I did go to a lot of, I do a lot of corporate work as well. So I'm actually straddling both lines. Um, I'm doing work with school districts, with classes. And then, you know, I just taught at like John Paul Mitchell Systems and Boston Medical. So I'm everywhere because everyone needs a concept of create, creative thinking and understanding our brains during the process. And I say that I, I feel a lot of the work I'm, I'm, I'm doing in corporate is hitting well because I have their childhood in mind. Mm. And what people don't understand is as an adult, as a 25 year old, a 35 year old or four 40 year old, how you're operating now, your belief systems are rooted to the foundational years. The most critical years of a human being's life is from zero to four. Correct. And then after that, it's about zero to uh, 12, right? Of where these foundations are being laid down and what your brain is laying down as far as culture, social interactions, risk taking, uh, what your creative identity is in the first place, you know, and there's so much there. And so I, I, I tell people, you can't have the conversation of, of wellness and connectivity and, and inclusion. You know, I do a lot of work of intercultural creativity without understanding, without giving people a chance to see, okay, well, what are my, my foundational structures that were put in place when I was um, a, a child? And so I'm able to, to link the two and to bring in concepts of social contagion, emotional contagion, mm -hmm. that we're contagious. Your, your emotions are affecting me right now, subconsciously, without me even being aware. You know, if you were starting to frown your face and look disengaged, my subconscious would pick up on, on that, right? And because I'm high, highly emotionally sensitive, my conscious would, would it as well. And so it's training leaders and parents and teachers, anyone who has a social influence over a group, how do you increase your tools in this area? And then how do we teach our children to grow up with these tools already in place as opposed to being our age and having to learn it, you know, in adulthood? It's better just to uh, teach ch children because in the words, lastly, I'll just say the words of Frederick Douglass, which I have on my wall right there. It's easier to build strong children than repair broken men and women. So we need to focus mm. on build, building strong children because it's e easier. <laughs> they don't have all the cultural backlash that a lot of adults carry. What you've shared, it feels like there's uh, very fine tight ropes to be able to walk. It's almost like you're, it's like you're a tightrope walker at the circus while you're also a juggler. You're like, you're doing both at the exact same point in time. Um, you have a large purpose and that can scare the ever living bejesus out of people when it's like, okay, I meant to do this, whatever this lands up being, if it's opening up uh, your own charity, if it's, you know, being a, lar a superintendent of a very large school district, if it's being a mom or a dad or a dog dad in my particular instance. Um, so we have the human experience and we have the emotions that we experience as well. We can feel, um, 
lost, afraid, alone, weak. There's different sorts of challenges, difficulties, obstacles, problems, stressors, troubles, worries, you name it. What were some of the things when you knew, okay, this is what your mission is, and especially integrating your work as a children's author as well too, what were some of the, or a few of the challenges that you experienced along the way? And what were some of the things that you feel helped you to get through to the other side when you were experiencing, whether it be fear or doubt or resistance or anything along the lines of that, what helped you to get through to the other side of that? There's so much there. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm, my background's in psychology and I tell, you know, when you're a teacher, you are not just a teacher, you know, you're, you're a counselor and a parent, the medic at times and the psychologist, you know, you have all, all, all these hats. And so I'm just very aware of the fact of what mindset plays into this. Mm -hmm. And, um, as, as you mentioned earl earlier that this, my projects are a family affair. My, my husband, um, is really in a big part of the illustration. You know, we, we did partner with someone to kind of help with the actual characters, but everything was kind of put together, uh, backgrounds, for foregrounds and the cup cover through him and Sean, the creative kid, my five-year-old is a part of helping me write, um, the book, especially our, our, our first, first book, uh, I am creative, you know, and he has co-copyright with the U S copyright office and everything and I did that on pur purpose for multiple reasons but to answer your question you know I was just sitting down with with Shane my my husband is like wouldn't it be cool if all the cool things that Sean's doing like literally right in front of us showing us unadulterated creative thinking and how he's making connections and you know he was taking a shower and like saw the suds come down he's like hey it's kind of like I'm in a car wash you know and that is metaphorical thinking right and and um associations and He's doing this naturally. And, you know, it's funny. I say, tell, I tell people, I get paid money to go into corporate to teach adults how to do this when my five-year-old is just doing it nat nat naturally. So there's, you know, like, where do we lose that? And I was just saying, Shane, like, wouldn't it be great if we took the 16 diamond tools and showed America how Sean is actually just doing it uh, um, just authentically? And what does that look like? And we could have just had a conversation and said, you know what? But no one writes a children's book with a three-year-old. Like, who does that? And just, we could have went on. But the hundreds and hundreds of people and children that I get, the pictures that I get of their child reading this book would not have happened if I would have just moved on. And so I tell people as we refashion their creative identity, we have to have a bias for action. And so I'm like, I've never written a children's book. How do you do that? Okay, well, I got on Fiverr and just found an illustrator. My husband didn't fully il illustrate the first book. He, he just kind of did the, the cover and, and did the other pages that just had the words and kind of threw some you know things together. He, he was more involved with the second book. But I found an illustrator on Fiverr and I was like, hey, can you draw you know, a little African-American boy um, playing at the playground? You know, it was just, I love the words. I think it's Theodore Roosevelt. He's like, do what you can where you are with what you have. Just get started. It doesn't have to be this, you know, I'm not selling millions of copies right now but um but I I said you know even if just his grandmother purchases a copy and no one else at least we did our best at least we just put our work out there at least as Seth Godin says at least we we shipped our our work right mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't ship they have the idea they may even start doodling some some concepts but it never comes to fruition and how many people are out there with empty hands waiting for you to ship your idea so we just got it done we did it the best i can shane cleaned everything up and kind of made it take took it to the next level level and then i just put it on amazon like there wasn't any of this there wasn't any pr there wasn't any book launch i was just like and okay <laughs> you know that's it then i just sent it out to family and friends but as i started speaking more to schools and doing more trainings i would bring it along and here's the the next big thing is we took the 16 diamond tools and we put them in in um in just poetry form right like bark acts like a protector of every single tree this poet way of thinking is called analogy so part of my made my conversation especially with um authors who are authoring like adult books like business books and self-help books if your message is so powerful that you need to get it to adults how more powerful would it be if you abstract it and put it in a children's book as well? Mm. That's basically what I did. 
my message of you know the uh, the 16 diamond tools of creative thinking the seven gems of intercultural creativity and then the work we're doing with neural somatic creativity these are adult you know thick business books can my brain abstract the main point and put it in a simple four line couplet or, or poem you know and and it, it's hard it's you have to think about it and then you have to rhyme you know and, and then i had to hire a poetry editor to help with the with the meter and everything but i mean it's it's wonderful and then for people like me who you teach you you connect with um you know teachers and and kids but you also do cor corporate work and you work with adults what a great way to have your adult book on sale and then have the the children's book to go with it. I have a lot of book, adults who go to these conferences and they're like, oh, I have to bring something back for my kid. This is perfect. You know, so even from a financial standpoint, it's a win-win. Um, but you're you're changing the lives of children as you're changing uh, the lives of adults as well. So that's my biggest thing is don't just have the idea. Get ready to be, have a bias for ac action. Um, start where you can with what you have, <laughs> you know, wherever you are. And and Fiverr is great if you get, if you can't hire a professional illustrator, like what forty bucks in in an image. You know, the second book was more of an invest investment. We hired, um, well, my husband did it, and then we 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 invested more. But the first book, I mean, you know, you can probably get it illustrated well for like a, a twenty page book you know, for under $400 or so. And the money you make back from, from it, especially if you're a speaker, um, it, it'll pay itself off. But the income, not not the financial income, it's something called the psychic in income, that emotional feeling you get when you've changed a life, that is priceless. Agreed. To see a, to see a five-year-old hold your book or to get, like I fly a lot. So sometimes I have a few extra copies in my bag and I walk up to parents are like, oh my gosh. I'm like, hi, I'm a children's book author. I just saw, I see you have a six year old. I, and, you know, my son and I always say, my son and I wrote a book together and they're like, ah. And so, yeah, just to see, just to bless someone in that way. It's just really um, exciting and encouraging. Mm. It's a very deep shirt. Want to take the time to acknowledge that. Before we continue on with episode number 178, of Pierre from the Hearts Children's Book Spotlight Series. Joining Little Forest and I here this week on the program is national award-winning educator and best-selling children's author, Janine Ledford. And we're about to dive into the pages of her brand new children's book, which is co-authored by her son, Sean, My Brain, My Brain, My Beautiful Brain. It is now available. You can head on over to cafestrategies.com. We've included the link to Janine's official website in the description below. In addition to Amazon.com, you can head on over to Amazon if that is your preferred online vehicle of your choosing. One of the many ways that you can support Janine, her son, Sean, as well as her husband, Shane, is by leaving a five-star review on Amazon. Again, one of the many ways you can pledge your support to let them know that they are doing wonderful work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books. Before we talk about my brain, my brain, my beautiful brain, um, you've been gifted a gift in your son. And at a very young age, he is already starting to do amazing things. Um, and I give you a lot of credit because, um, you know, even though I'm only a dog dad and I'm not, you know, the dad of a physical human little one just yet to this particular point in time, um, I've seen parents over the years where they will either try to live vicariously through their child or they will try to. Um, have them be all up in the spotlight when they don't necessarily want to be. And from connecting with your work, like you're encouraging your son to just be himself. And I find that that's something that can get lost in the shuffle because there's times where we may want our little ones to, uh, to have the things that we didn't have when we were a kid. And we can just, again, the, the, the alignment and the emotions and the feelings that are involved, we can do things that can really mess up our kids' lives, maybe not intentionally, but um, subconsciously or unintentionally, so to speak. What has this process been like for you as a mother at the same point in time being able to create with not only your son, but your husband? Because this is something that, again, you just walk up to the average Joe or Joanne on the street and not everyone is necessarily doing this. So how rewarding is this, not only from the creative perspective, but from the emotional bond that you have, the three of you together? Well, I do have this interesting uh, perspective because I was an educator. So 
I, I had the opportunity to see the correct curriculum and see how the children were interacting with the curriculum and what the implicit curriculum was teaching. And we need to be mindful, you know, in the state of California, writing is all through, you know, the writing standards. You have to write a persuasive, persuasive essay and you have to know how to write a letter and you have to know how to put points together in order to defend your, your, your point, correct? And, um, and non, non-fiction writing and fiction writing. And so we, I would have my kids, you know, write whatever the, the, the standards were calling for. And then they would write and then I would, you know, grade them and give them feed, feedback and, and, and do all the things that the teachers do. And then I give it back to them and it, it goes home. Hopefully they show their parents or whatever. And it goes in a drawer somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. I know I've written things. I don't know where all your writings are, but they're, I have no idea where they are. And besides the teacher grading them, probably no one else saw, saw them, right? And so I'm just like, if we're talking about creativity and some of my work is a, a financial literacy as well, Entrepreneurship should be a part of the conversation, especially for this for this um, generation. You know, there's more than one way to produce income, and there's more than one option just to be an employee for someone else. We have to start communicating that way. And so I said, Sean also has to go through the standards. He has to learn how how to write. That's a part of of uh, the standards of the states that we're living in. But we're going to take it the other step. He has to know how to write these things, but he also I want him to know how to publish as well and say, hey, I wrote this. Here's my work. And and so it, there's a duality here. Number one, just taking what he's doing as far as his creative life and kind of ha- having us put it all together and showing him, like I say, look, Sean, the person's holding your book. They're reading your book. And so he has ownership of, of that. He's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, they're they're reading the book I wrote, you know. And um, and so I want him, I'm almost like brainwashing him to say, hey, you can be creative and you can have someone else hold your creative product. Like, what does that look like, you know? And we don't, I don't think we give our, our children that feeling. Um, some may fall into it. And a lot of kids are entrepreneurial on their own. You know, you have these small kids starting like little lemonade stands and, and things like, like that. And we need to celebrate that more. But um, just seeing that that we need to just give the creativity that entrepreneurial aspect. That's one 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 of the other drivers of this work. Um, and yeah, just celebrating the fact that someone would want to trade me. You know, uh, one woman, um, we were parking our car and one woman went because we were just going to gift her the book because uh, she had a little son with her and she went to her car and grabbed $20 and gave it to Sean and mm-hmm. said, this is for your, like, that's, that's memorable. Like, I want your book and here's $20. And, and she was adamant. She was like, I don't want your book for free. I want to invest in you. And for right now, because he is still young, we're doing it together, but the goal is when he becomes, you know, uh, more in, independent and he's able to write more things. And soon, you know, like maybe middle school, he's able to upload his own work or like fourth grade, fifth, fifth grade is like, I, this is a part of his cur- curriculum, right? How do I write? That's every, every child, that's the, every child's cur- curriculum. How do I, I put it in on a Word document, format it, but how do I upload it to Amazon, design a cover, either work with dad or, or Fiverr or myself, right? Design a cover, put it on Amazon, get an ISBN number. And I told him, I don't care if you put it for 99 cents, I just need you to get the muscle there. So you know your creativity has value. In some writings you wanna share, some you don't. That's your, your choice, but you have to know that this is an option. We have to give our, our kids the, the value of, of that. And it's the, the last thing to answer your question about it's just being a, a fa- family project. I believe that people need to see see that. You know, there's a lot of families that the, the mom and dad are in diff- different fields and kind of working diff- um, different areas, and then they come home to be be the family. And and I, I support support that as well. Uh, but with this case, divinely, it worked out this this way, and it's kind of fun to see that we can create things together. It helps with our bonding. It helps when we travel. <laughs> we can write stuff off. And, like, and, um, <laughs> and it's just that how do we use our life? I just feel, you know, I come from, from a faith-based um, position, but I just feel like how do we use our life and our time? A hundred years is a very short time on, on, on the earth. When the vast of human existence, a hundred years is a blip. 
how do we use our 100 years to be as creative as possible and to produce as much as possible for the future generations coming after us? That was a driving question for our work. And then if we can do it together, Sean will continue this work with his family. We, we hope and pray, but at least it's there. You know, I've said after 18, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to publish ever again, but at least you'll have the training and the options. So in case you do wish to continue it, at least you know how, right? Correct. And that's, that's the, um, the imp impetus of our continued work. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation, this isn't necessarily the traditional children's picture book because the traditional children's book, it has the story, the message, the illustrations, but this has even more depth and substance to it because I can remember, I'm not sure when was the first time that I was introduced to the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brainstem, all the ooey gooey goodness that's within inside our nervous system and brain. But, and you probably heard this maybe from people along the way since the book has been released. I wish I had this when I was a kid because it can Aww. make learning that much more fun. There's times again, when you're learning about, I know like when I was learning about uh, like uh, magma and lava and igneous and sedimentary uh, rocks, right? Like if you can find Metaphor. a way to bring what could seem like boring pedestrian kinds of things to life, it just makes it that much uh much more interesting so to speak take us behind the scenes if you could in terms of the creation of this you obviously had a vision you wanted to stick to it and to have this book stand out as something special so it was a learning tool so kids could learn more about the brain and the importance of you know all the different parts and facets of you know all of the inner workings of it but to also have a sweet story in the process, which of course, when people think of, you know, children's books, they love the sweet stories in the process. So, and then after that, if you can take us inside the pages of the story, we don't like giving away the whole kit and caboodle on the children's book spotlight. Series. So <laughs> if you can let our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and of course our fellow shining stars know a little bit about the, the magical journey that Sean is on during the course of the book. Sure, sure. I don't know if you want me to hold hold some some pages up or or not. But first of all, understanding how the brain retains information, um, rhyme is you know story form and then rhyme po po poetry. I just um, I have a book called Your Brain on Art, and I just read the the chapter about what's going on in your brain when there's poetry involved. And so, I love po poetry, so that's where I, I wanted a lot of my my books to be in poem form. I did that uh, intentionally. So. That's that structure. And then a lot of my work is in cultural um, creativity. So looking at inclusion, looking at how the brain connects with people from different lived experiences, not just ethnically, but all the, di the dimensions of diversity. What, what does that look like? And so all the characters in the books, you know, they're heavily diverse. Um, they look different and they're, they're just coming from different backgrounds, but coming together in order to explore this jour journey and in my trainings of adults, <laughs> I realized a lot of the issues with just, you know, diversity, a lot of the issues with diversion, you know, just separate um, in-group, out-group, and just in all the isms, the sexism, racism, um, ableism, all of these separatist just issues we have, it's rooted in the brain. No one knows about <laughs> this critical three pound organ that we carry around is moving everything. And Dr. David Eagleman, who I had the pleasure of, of meet, meeting, he has a wonderful documentary on pbs.org called The Brain. He says that your subconscious mind, you know, the mind that you're not even aware of below conscious thought is running the show. Your conscious mind, the part that wakes up when you're waking up and everything, your conscious mind is the broom closet in the mansion of your brain. Think about that and not now analogy, right? 5% of your brain is your conscious mind. Everything else is going on below awareness. And so my goal, you know, this isn't the, the, the last book I'm writing, the last children's book I'm writing about the brain, but my goal is to, how can we give people, uh, children and adults alike, more tools to use their brain in an effective way and to know, you know, emotional regulation, that's part of the brain, um, in group, out group, how you you see pe uh, people and, and your internal mo model, um, your culture, how you observe. You know, half the time we're not even paying attention <laughs> to the things around us. We're not 
aware of nature and all the creativity that we can learn from from nature. We're not paying attention to patterns, you know, and and things like that. And what do I, I mean? This we don't even have enough time to talk about the arts and what the arts literally do to the brain, what music does, mm. and I mean that's a whole podcast in its own self. But all of this rich information that can help the well-being of human beings, you know, little human beings and tall and and adult human beings, we have no access to. And so now that we are in the decade of the brain, the technology is showing us so much. We need to be aware of it and start modifying and adjusting the way we teach, the way we interact, the way we put people into groups, and giving people more power so we can move. This inclusion conversation forward, the education conversation forward, and the parenting. I mean, the parenting conversation forward. So,、um, once again, the the book is in cup couplets, and it goes over the six main sections of the brain, like the brainstem, the cerebellum, the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temp temporal lobes. And then, the the key part is I go into another section talking about Gardner's multiple intelligences. Gone are the days, I believe, of just focusing on one area. Like I am a biochemist, and that's all I do, and that's all I focus on. Your top creative thinkers who are going to move are the top, are the ones who have a good, strong foundation in a particular area or two, but they're also aware of other areas. So I'm an I'm an educator. I'm an elementary educator by trade. But I have a huge background in neuroscience. I taught music and the arts and ran theater programs.、Um, you know, I'm an ent- entrepreneur, so looking at business. And then my my brothers and sisters work for NASA and they're astrophysicists. So I have a direction, a direct connection to to that world. And and so I'm in my have my feet in different worlds. And lastly, I'll end with a quote because, as you see, I, I love I love quotes.、Um, the writer of the Medici effect. Like how creativity really thrives in certain areas, he said, innovation happens at the intersection of fields, disciplines, and cultures.、Mm. That's key. The intersection. So the Howard Gardner brings up the point of having a synthesizing mind. Who is aware of what's going on, right? And I'm a, I'm a futurist. I'm trying to see around the corner. I'm you know the curiosity, and then I am creating things now. What the workforce is going to need five years from now? That's key. But my thing is, how do we teach our kids to do that from day one, as opposed to scrambling in adulthood and getting these t- tools in place? And so I'm trying to hit both areas. And the lastly, as you saw,、um, the last part of the book is for the adults. And I talk to parents, teachers, caregivers, and leaders. Of saying, hey, here's what's going on in your cerebellum. Here's the fact that your cerebellum is used for your walking and your your、um, you know you just having balance, but it also monitors your prefrontal cortex, which is where you plan. You have your creativity, your decision making. You can em- regulate your emotions, you know, <laughs> and do things like that. So when you move, when you dance, when you Just you know, move throughout space, you know, in karate or whatever type of movement you choose, you're actually sharpening your prefrontal cortex. And so you're heading, we're heading into a decade with people who have access to this information are going to be rising to the top. So we might as well get it into to your pre-K and your kinder, right? So they can develop it by the time they hit the work workforce. I really love the book as well too because it keeps the conversation going. So little ones have the opportunities to follow along with a magical story, but then again, you know, parents and、uh, and teachers and caregivers, caretakers, they want to be able to learn more for themselves, but also in the process then to be able to pass along to their children.、Uh, I always feel that the best books are the ones that you can come back to multiple、mm. times and over. And there's so much. Like I know that being able to go through it, it took me more than one time. To be able to truly connect with the message of my brain, my brain, my beautiful brain. I do want to. I always like to share my favorite illustration spreads that are found within the course of the children's book that we're featuring on the children's book spotlight series, and leave it to just the very beginning of the book. My brain, my brain, my beautiful brain. Ideas flow through it like rivers of rain. My brain is a wonder. Helps me do all I do as I live and create. And the same goes for you. And then it basically goes into the six sections of the brain. That itself. I want to take the time to recognize that is a beautiful, affirmative statement. 
And again, like there are children, this is the, this is what I want to mention as well too. There are children that are told, whether it be by their parents, consciously or subconsciously, or good natured people that can come across the wrong way, you're not creative. You're not stupid or, or you're stupid. You're not going to amount to anything. And I feel that just through the affirmative, just through that part of the book, if I'm, you know, I know that when the time comes when I'm going to be a father on mine of things, I'm going to hold on to this book and say, reread these first two pages and read them over and over and over again, because kids need to hear this. Kids' minds and hearts, they're like sponges, as you mentioned earlier on in the conversation. I just wanted to take the time to acknowledge that because it could just seem like two spreads in the book so to speak, but they're very, they're, they're very important on so many different levels. We're beginning to wind down our time here with our featured guest here on episode number 178 of Pierre from the Hearts Children's Book Spotlight Series, national award-winning educator and best-selling children's author, Janine Ledford. We are fully immersed in her brand new children's book that is co-authored by her son, Sean, as well as illustrated by her, her husband, Shane. My brain, my brain, my beautiful brain is now available you can head on over to Janine's official website, cafestrategies.com, the link of which we've included in the description below. If amazon.com is your preferred online vehicle of your choosing, remember you can purchase your copy of My Brain, My Brain, My Beautiful Brain. In addition to Janine's other children's book, I Am Creative, you can leave five-star reviews, of course. One of the many ways you can pledge your support for Janine and her family to let them know that they're doing wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, educators, those who love great children's books is by leaving a five-star review. A um, couple of the things that I wanted to touch upon and one of the things that really came to mind is the value of creativity. This kind of touches upon what I started to mention a few moments ago. Creativity really is very important. It is our driving force. It is why we are here. We are here to create. Um, Speak to that thread if you could, because especially during the pandemic when, you know, all the distractions were gone, we couldn't go to, and, and I'm not saying baseball games and going to amusement parks are distractions, but to a certain extent they are. They're, they're fun, they're amazing, but literally we had this golden opportunity to be able to be with our kids and say, you know, take the time to draw or take the time to read or take the time to write. And so, you know, now that the pandemic is over, you know, some people have just kind of moved on and gone back to the way that things were beforehand. But I feel that it's a matter of, we, we had a very golden opportunity and many of us took advantage of that. Could you speak to the thread of the value of creativity and why it's really important, not only for ourselves as grownups, but also for our children, maybe now more than ever before? Sure, sure. That's uh, very important to touch upon. So there is a network in your brain. Your brain has a series of networks going on, something called the default mode network. It's very important for us to understand that. And I hope people kind of go and do some research about it. I do talk about it in the book. Actually, there's a page where Sean is kind of staring out in, into space uh, at, at, the, at the very end. And um, yeah, it says, Pondering my own choices, my own reasons and strengths helps me to lead and grow to great lengths and the interpersonal effect. And what he's doing right there is he's tapping into his default mode network. That is the network that they have found is your ability to really just get those creative ideas from the subconscious to the conscious, the unusual associations. A lot of times people have, you know, if you can answer this question, where do some of your great ideas come from? Like, what, what are you doing when some of your great ideas, you're like, oh, yeah. Like, what, where are you in life when that happens? Mm -hmm. That's actually a question for you to, an to answer. Like, are you in the kitchen? Are you dr like, what, what are you doing when some of your best ideas come, come to you? I really feel that the best things tend to happen when I'm very connected when I'm very grounded and also the best things happen when I least expect them. So to speak. it feels for me, at least when I'm trying to think too much, like what's, I, I can tend to get into this little creative crux, so to speak, mm -hmm. but it's also when I'm having fun and okay. when I'm enjoying life. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of those neurons, those synapses just really are firing on all cylinders, so to speak. Yes, and they're finding out like, also when you're having fun and when you're doing undemanding work that's not needed, that your focus really isn't need, needed, 
And they say, you know, I mean, people are in the shower when they're kind of taking a walk and, and they're just, you know, staring at things or staring off in, in the space. You're kind of driving a route that you already know. So you don't have to really focus on the driving aspect and the fact that or even just like kind of just laying down the fact that they found the fact that when you're not really doing anything that needs your focus, your default mode network turns on. And that's mm -hmm. when your thoughts are kind of almost having a dance party and then some associations are, are coming in, you know, and, and, and your, your neurons are kind of meet, meet, meeting up, um, metaphorically speaking. And that's critical for creativity. That's the, the essence of innovation. They're also, you know, saying it's important for our social brain network as well. We're thinking about our, our relationships and things that happen in conversations. If you've ever been in a conversation and then an hour later, you're just like, oh, I should have said that, right? That's your default mode net network turning on and you're reviewing these social encounters and that's critical. And what we're finding is we're so busy now, we're not allowing our default mode network to take place, right? And we wanna make sure um, we, we don't get into worry, right? You could be default mode network into worry and spiral that way. But as long as you know, you're, you're staying positive and you're thinking about you know, just creative cool things or just thinking about life in gen general, um, that's really good. And so what the pandemic did, it slowed us down. It made us uh, connect and, even, you know, and sometimes it, it did produce a little isolation. So we that really showed us the importance of social connection. And your brain's a social brain. So it needs that connection. Very important. But it also, like you said, removed some of the external distractions that took our focus and didn't allow our brain that downtime to really you know, dance with itself, basically. And so we tell people, and, and I'm telling cor corporate, you know, put in your calendar an hour to stare out the window. <laughs> like, call it what you want. Language is powerful. Deep think time or creative thinking time, whatever you want to call it. But that's essential for these new perspectives to arise to consciousness. And, um, and once again, if we figure out how to teach it to children and have it be a part of their normal cultural way of being, it'll be easy for them to hold on to that type of um, existence in their adult adulthood. And creativity is needed more than ever. And so people who have these traits and habits in place will be the ones that will, that are your top 2% creative think, uh, thinkers. And so once again, make sure people know creativity isn't just about artistry. Creativity is your ability to problem find and problem solve, right? Mm -hmm. Highly creative people are not just waiting for for things to fall in their lap from their, their teachers or their bosses. They're out there being curious. Well, why are we doing it this way? Well, has anyone thought about, about this? And they're seeing parallels between different, like Sean seeing the car wash and his own um, showering process. Like that's a parallel um, processing. So we need adults to do that as well. The way the Ford T model was put together, um, one of the mechanics went to a meat processing plant and saw them taking apart pigs. They were like, well, if one person can do one thing, well, could we just reverse it and have one person put it on? And that was the, the birth of um, just the, the industry of the industrial in, industry of assembling cars that way. And it took one car assemb assembling was like, what, 12 hours. But after they put it on that assembly line, an hour and a half. So it totally changed that, but people are able to see parallels and metaphors in, in the work. And you're able to do that if you have some downtime to really let your thoughts wander and recombine. I'm glad that you mentioned that last part, especially because I feel that this also uh, combines with the importance of play and yes. just allowing yourself to just have that intentional free time, so to speak, because if your brain is always on mm -hmm. and then it's a matter of, I know I can speak from experience. This is something that's been taking me, you know, maybe longer than what I would have wanted, so to speak, but the way in which I always operate is I was always on. And when I was always on, I treated things more like to do's and it really mm -hmm. took away from the presence, from my presence, as well as the being. So I feel that when we're when we allow ourselves to give us that time, that space, that breathing room and the time to play, we can be more. And then that's when more of the creativity flows through is when we're in that being state, so to speak. Um, yeah. We always like to give useful and supportive information, tips, tools, strategies to parents, to caregivers, to grandparents, to educators, 
encouraging our ch our children's creativity is something that really is needed. It's something that we need to do every single day. And let's be honest, those who are taking care of children or they are in the lives of a child, again, parent, grandparent, caregiver, educator, they can be wiped. <laughs> they can be wiped, tired, stretched, uh, mm -hmm. stressed. What are some specific things that we can do as parents and caregivers and those who are even educators of children to be able to encourage our children's creativity? Sure. It's so important because children learn, humans learn through observation, right? Through interact action and experience, but also through observation. And so I put in the book, model it. You know, how can I model walking out to the mailbox and being in all of the rocks, you know, in the colors of, of the rocks, things that are mundane to us, we need to kind of re and re-encounter with, with a sense of awe because we can support that in the children. Another thing is be aware of something called the curse of knowledge. The fact that you're an adult and you've been through a lot of experiences that a three-year-old has not. So keep in mind, these are new for the, the child and to not expect the child to know what you know, uh, right? And so for a really quick example, Sean was taking scissors to one of his plastic mats. And of course, a nor normal response is like, no, no, don't cut that, right? because uh, that's a mat we need it for the function of eating but then I had to step back and say wait he doesn't know the sensation of cutting rubber that's what he's looking for he's not like let me wake up and destroy all of the furniture that's not his motivation his motivation is let me figure out how the world works and what my place in it that's the mo motivation that's their job right figuring out how the world works and so with that I just got a whole bunch of textured things right and, and Put him you're right there with some scissors, like have at it. You want, this is what you're curious. I want to support your curiosity. So if I'm always saying no, 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 guess what? I have an adult who that's their, your, that's their internal voice now. I tell parents and caretakers, whatever you tell the child from zero to 12 becomes their internal voice as an adult. And so a parent came to me and was like, yeah, my, my older child, I think they're in high school, he doesn't do in, in anything, but I think I caused that because when he was young, I would, wouldn't let him do anything because I was just so afraid he would get hurt. Um, but but the, of course we want to keep our kids safe, but the brain learns through experience, you know? And right. and um, and there was one time when Sean was swinging on the, the, the handlebars and one hand let go. And of course I want to run and, and grab him so he doesn't fall. But something stopped me. It was like, Janine, just just watch him. Just watch him. Because he's learning how his body works with gravity, with, with mo momentum. Like he needs to go through that experience. And so parents who jump in too fast, you know, um, we're robbing them of, of that learning time to figure out how their bodies work. And lastly, you know, um, there was a huge just um, news report of parents who were writing checks for the, their kids to get into college, like the back doorway. It happened around like 19, uh, 2017 or so, or, or, or sometime around there. And we're all focused on this, a few celebrities that did it and got caught. But I was telling people like, what a form of child abuse, because you're robbing the children of the natural process of doing something on their own, possibly getting rejected, Newsflash, rejection is a part of life, you you know, and the earlier they can feel it and then get back up and keep on move, moving, the better it is. And so when we hinder, once again, our children from being curious, always saying no and um, just not letting them, you know, keeping them safe, make sure they don't run out into the middle of the street. There's certain boundaries that we have to set, but where is there a safe way where they can still still test out things? And, um, and making sure we don't rob our children of being rejected. Rejection is a part of life. And if we give our children the tools to handle rejection, then when they get to be 25 and something happens, their whole world won't fall apart. They're able to, as we call um, this in creative thinking, uh, shift perspectives, um, distal think thinking, um, reappraisal, right? Emotional reappraisal and things. They, they have the tools to continue to function, to say, hey, this route didn't work. What are my other op options? I'm still a, a great person. I'm still a creative person. I can do this. Let's keep moving on. That These are the skills. Our job as parents and caretakers are to give them their box of tools so when they become adults, their creativity can thrive and survive and be resilient 
um, through it all and they can ship their ideas to the world. That is a perfect response. And I feel again, the way in which you're just communicating everything, there's there there's so much more that we can dive into. But again, we want to be mindful and respectful of all of your time who are enjoying this wonderful conversation. You can keep the conversation going with Janine on social media. We've also included her social media platforms in the description below. I would be remiss and I know that I am super excited because this is going to be one of the crown jewels of the nine-year anniversary celebration of PR from the Heart. You're going to be in Los Angeles, Saturday, August the 5th, building a culture of reading in your classroom. And you're going to be teaming up with award-winning and best-selling children's author and illustrator, Catherine Roy, the award-winning creator of the first 12 days of preschool, uh, Jeanette Crystal Bradley, along with the great school counselor and the creator of the Adventures of Harold from the Hood series, Jim Price. Um, just to briefly speak upon, because we're going to be, of course, doing so much more over these next couple of weeks talking about the event. But, you know, once we kind of get to the 4th of July holiday, parents are kind of like, okay, it's back to school time. And I know that kids, I can only imagine it's like, hooray, summer vacation. Then like a couple of weeks later, they go into like Target and Walmart. And I'm like, oh, school supplies. <laughs> no, no, we did. We still got time. Um, the importance of that and building a culture of reading in classrooms. We've seen literacy levels plummet across the country as the result of the pandemic and parents and educators, caregivers, it's like, we're still kind of like, to a certain extent, trying to make up for lost time, get back, get, get kids back to where they need to be. Um, you'll be speaking more about this during the panel discussion that's going to be a part of building a culture of reading in your classroom. But if there's a specific message, at least one or two specific thing that you want to be able to communicate with parents and educators now, before the event, when it comes to building a culture of reading in your classroom and the significance of that, why it's paramount, what would that personalized message be? Well, as a third grade teacher for um, many years and working with that age, of that is really building their reading skills. We need to be more mindful of the how the brain is functioning and how the arts can actually add extra entry points into the curriculum for that. It brings in motivation, something called acetylcholine, which allows for neuroplasticity to occur, um, neural noise, right? And how does early music training help with phonemic awareness, things along those lines. We're just being aware of so many just, just tips and so many strategies that you and I may not have had when you and I were going through the school that we need to implement right away to give our kids the success that they they need. And so really adding these in that all have to do with, with the brain will be a topic of discussion for that wonderful event that we're so excited for. And yeah. Sean might, might, might be there as well. So you'll be able to get your book stamped by Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that as well, too. So again, for all educators and parents, all of our friends and neighbors out in the greater Los Angeles and surroundings area, building a culture of reading in your classroom, Saturday, August the 5th, beginning at 2 p.m. We Pacific time, we've included the Eventbrite link in the description below so you can find out more details about the event. Two ways that we always close out every children's book spotlight series. We're big proponents of Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He still lives on in so many ways, even 20 years after his passing, you know, two decades after the airing of the final episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, um, in many ways, shapes and forms through his time on the neighborhood when he spoke at different um, colleges for commencement speeches, uh, talks at different uh, institutions, library organizations, and most notably when he received his Lifetime Achievement Award at the Daytime Emmy shortly before he passed from stomach cancer, he encouraged all of us to remember those who helped love us into being. Mm. And that was his way of helping us to remember all of those people that encouraged us to say, hey, you've got creativity inside of you. You've got gifts, skills, talents that need to be expressed and shared. You've obviously mentioned your, your husband, you've mentioned your son, and they undoubtedly have helped love you into being. Who are some of the other people that you would like to take the time to publicly recognize here in episode number 178 of the Children's Book Spotlight series that helped love you, Janine Ledford, into being? 
well, of course, my, my mother, she's an educator herself. And I say she's the founder of intercultural creativity because she created a home culture of exposing us to different types of people and different things and new, new no novelty, uh, all, all the you know, traveling and everything. So that's a, um, a, a big force in the work that I do. And then I would also would like to, um, to, to share about Mr. Miller, Mr. Stephen Miller, my sixth grade te teacher who I dedicated my educational book to and wrote the opening forward and he just like i'm trying to do make learning come alive instead of just reading a book about the gold rush which we, we did reading reading is very important leaders are readers but he also took us to the back of the school where we were digging through dirt looking for gold you know and he brought in music and really made the the sensorial platform available for us to learn through different senses, through different gates into the um, curriculum. And so I dedicate my work to my mother and, and Mr. Mil Miller because they loved me into being, but they taught me, they culturized me into being for the next generation. And so that's really what great work is. You take all the gems that were given to you and you reformat -mat them and make them into a beautiful mosaic and then you hand them on to the next generation. And that's what we're looking to do with these children's books and our continued work in intercultural creativity and neurosomatic creativity. And I feel that, uh, I believe this is how Mr. Rogers described it, is that, you know, if those people that are those uh, angels on our path, so to speak, whether they're near or far, whether they're still with us or whether they're watching us from above, they are smiling down on us knowing the impact that they made on our lives, especially when it comes to helping us connect with our creativity. Um, the last thing is, Walter, you have given so freely from your heart to children, parents, families, educators, in different realms and for a lengthy period of time. And I feel that it's your time to receive, Janine. Now, uh, we go back to one of our favorite Disney animated classics. We remember the genie of the lamp. We remember 1992, we remember the late Robin Williams. Um, and I feel this all connects in the process because we have the abilities, and we've talked about this as well during our Children's Book Spotlight Series episode today. We have these skills and gifts and talents, and it's important that we help other people to know that they have those gifts within them as well too. So we have a little segment that we like to call Three Wishes. We have <laughs> an actual genie lamp that's here in our studio and in our office as well too. So you're being given three wishes on this episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series. Now, again, they can be for yourself, for your family, for the children of the world. Um, I think the only automatic disqualifiers, according to the genie, is that you can't make someone fall in love with you and you can't ask for more wishes. But anything else is, <laughs> anything else is pretty much fair game. So what would those wishes be that you'd like to put out? First one would be uh, that every child would have a copy of their own book, <laughs> Brain to Brain. And and especially every child in our hospitals, our children's hospitals. The second uh, second wish would be that people would fall in love with their brains and their mind, body, soul, spirit connection, right? Mm -hmm. And the possibilities of, of that awareness of that connection. And the third one would, would be, I would have this, my, me and my family would have the same impact of someone like Maya Angelou, where she's no longer, or, or Fred Rogers, they're no longer here physically, but they're still working because their creative works are still working. So if I wanted to read her book or see her podcast or, or just I, like, she's still here, you know, and as you mentioned, Fred, his work is still here. His essence is still here, even though his physical body is no longer with. So I would like my family to have that same level of impact where our work is still working, even when our physical bodies are no longer. So that's what I would like. And we appreciate you sharing those wishes as well, too. If they're all, if, if those wishes come from one's heart, they always have a greater chance of coming to fruition. And of course, one of the things that we always love here is that when little Forrest, who's just taking a little siesta, he's taking a little nap over here. Mm -hmm. When he takes the time to really get into a children's book, he likes to give it two paws up. So little Forrest has given two paws up, which is the best endorsement for any children's book out there. It's kind of somewhat comparable to being on the New York Times bestseller list. But like, if you're like, <laughs> if you're a pet aficionado, it's equally as good, so to speak. So little Forrest gives two paws up. We encourage you to give two thumbs up to My Brain, My Brain, My Beautiful Brain. You can purchase your copies 
by heading on over to Janine's official website, cathestrategies.com, amazon.com, if that's your preferred online vehicle of your choosing. You can not only purchase your copies of My Brain, My Brain, My Beautiful Brain, but also I Am Creative. Leave five-star reviews because, again, those are the ways, just several, that you can pledge your support for Jeannie and her family to let them know that they're doing wonderful and much-needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books. For all educators as well across the country who are tuning in to episode 178 of the Children's Book Spotlight series, if you would like to facilitate an author school visit, for Janine during the back to school season or the 20 or really into the we're already going to be talking about the 2024 school year because it's part of the 2023 2024 school year you can also connect with Janine via her official website raise your hand if you have had fun on episode number 178 of the children's book spotlight series Janine's got her hands up I've got my hands up the little ones have their hands up on screen as we like to say that means double thumbs up mission accomplished job well done. If these messages that we have shared, talking about our creativity and connecting with our creativity and encouraging and reminding children that they have that creativity within to be able to better understand the mind, body, spirit connection. If you say, you know what, now I can feel more enthused, excited, animated when I'm talking about the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brainstem, the lobes, etc. You can, of course, Subscribe to Pierre from the Heart's Official YouTube channel if you haven't had the chance to do so. And share this trolley stop that you have been enjoying. That is episode number 170 of the Children's Book Spotlight Series. Because, of course, when we hear the trolley, that means that it is time to go. But again, there are many more magical trolley stops to come as the countdown has begun to our nine-year anniversary celebration, as well as the countdown to the 200th episode of the Children's Book Spotlight series. So if you are a children's author or a middle grade author and would like to share your inspiring story and the release of your brand new book, just as Janine did here this week on the program, we encourage you to head on over to our official website, prfromtheheart.com, or connect with us via any of our social media platforms that you now see on screen. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all at PR From The Heart. We're looking forward to sharing more trolley stops with our dear friend and neighbor. Of course, you remember him, you love him as the beloved Mr. McFeely on the long-running children's television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. David Newell joins us each and every month on PR from the Hearts Neighborly Reviews podcast, where we take the time to, as a little tip of the cap to his character, we deliver the newest heartfelt reviews from the newest children's books from the top award-winning and best-selling children's authors and the shining stars in the kid-lit community. So if you are a children's author and would like David and I to be able to share and review your brand new children's book and a forthcoming edition of the Neighborly Reviews Bookcast, you know where to connect with us. And of course, we are fully immersed in our back to school season and soon we will be in the midst of the holiday season. So if you are a children's author or a middle grade author and would like to be able to not only share your inspiring story, not only the release of your brand new children's book, but to really connect with more parents and educators and caregivers and actually do that through the media. If you're interested in facilitating a national book media tour, a book media tour in a city or cities of your choosing, or simply to facilitate one or two featured television interviews, let us see how we can be of support to you at PR From The Heart. Schedule your courtesy connection call by heading on over to our official website at prfromtheheart.com. One final time, you can head on over to cafestrategies.com, which we've included the link below. If you're wondering, how do I spell cafe strategies? We've got you covered with regards to that. Head on over to Amazon.com as well if that's your preferred online vehicle of your choosing. You can leave five-star reviews for not only I Am Creative, but also My Brain, My Brain, My Beautiful Brain. It is required summer reading. Yes, I know you might say required <laughs> summer reading. You'll really have fun with this book. And it's also a great resource, especially if your little ones are gearing up for the back-to-school season as well. Again, you can leave five-star reviews for both books. One of the many ways you can pledge your support for Janine, for her son, Sean, for her husband, Shane, to let them know that they're doing wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books. Mm -hmm. We want to thank all of you for your continued support of PR from the heart, for your continued support of the children's book spotlight series, for your continued support of children's authors and illustrators, such as Janine, who again are doing wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books for your continued support of local libraries and independent and children's bookstores, truly the pillars of our community. And above all else, we want to thank you for helping us 
to walk home the children of the world one last time we of course we connect with the spirit of mr rogers he reminded all of us through his time on mr rogers neighborhood and i feel in many ways shapes and forms that he may have met Ponce de Leon in a past life because somehow Mr. Rogers weighed 143 pounds for his natural adult life. He found the fountain of youth, but that was one of his ways, the primary way in which he was communicating the love that he had for us, the love that we need to have for ourselves. There's one letter in I, four letters in love, and three letters in you. So as mm -hmm. Janine was very kind enough to give us some of her free time this week, we are reminding you, just as Mr. Rogers did, of your inherent worth and your inherent value and your ultimate creativity. Two letters in we, four letters in love, three letters in you. So we share our favorite three numbers, two, four, three. That is our reminder that we like you, that we love you just the way that you are. And we see the divinity. We see that ultimate creativity within you. So for Little Forest, for myself, John Massalonis, for Janine Letford, thank you for spending some time with us here as part of this extended holiday with the 4th of July, and we hope that you continue to enjoy the rest of the summer as well. And thank you for being a part of our summer reading season, especially here at PR from the Heart and the Children's Book Spotlight Series. And again, thank you for helping us to walk home. The children of the world, our fellow friends, our fellow neighbors, and our fellow shining stars. Goodbye for now. Bye.